Chapter 11 of At the Earth's Core. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Carpenter. At the Earth's Core by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 11 Four Dead Mayhars. A moment later I was standing before a dozen Mayhars, the social investigators of Futra. They asked me many questions through a Sagoth interpreter. I answered them all truthfully. They seemed particularly interested in my account of the outer earth and the strange vehicle which had brought Perry and me to Pellucidar. I thought that I had convinced them, and after they had sat in silence for a long time following my examination, I expected to be ordered returned to my quarters. During this apparent silence they were debating through the medium of strange unspoken language the merits of my tale. At last the head of the tribunal communicated the result of their conference to the officer in charge of the Sagoth guard. Come, he said to me, you are sentenced to the experimental pits for having dared to insult the intelligence of the mighty ones with the ridiculous tale you have had the temerity to unfold to them. Do you mean that they do not believe me? I asked, totally astonished. Believe you, he laughed. Do you mean to say that you expected anyone to believe so impossible a lie? It was hopeless, and so I walked in silence beside my guard, down through the dark corridors and runways, toward my awful doom. At a low level we came upon a number of lighted chambers in which we saw many Mayhars engaged in various occupations. To one of these chambers my guard escorted me, and before leaving they chained me to a side wall. There were other humans similarly chained. Upon a long table lay a victim even as I was ushered into the room. Several Mayhars stood about the poor creature, holding him down so that he could not move. Another, grasping a sharp knife with her three-toed forefoot, was laying open the victim's chest and abdomen. No anesthetic had been administered, and the shrieks and groans of the tortured man were terrible to hear. This, indeed, was vivisection with a vengeance. Cold sweat broke out upon me as I realized that soon my turn would come and to think that where there was no such thing as time I might easily imagine that my suffering was enduring for months before my death finally released me. The Mayhars had paid not the slightest attention to me as I had been brought into the room, so deeply immersed were they in their work, that I am sure they did not even know that the Sagoths had entered with me. The door was close by, would that I could reach it, but those heavy chains precluded any such possibility. I looked about for some means of escape from my bonds. Upon the floor between me and the Mayhars lay a tiny surgical instrument which one of them must have dropped. It looked not unlike a button-hook, but was much smaller, and its point was sharpened. A hundred times in my boyhood days I had picked locks with a button-hook. Could I but reach that little bit of polished steel I might yet effect at least a temporary escape. Crawling to the limit of my chain I found that by reaching one hand as far out as I could my fingers still fell an inch short of the coveted instrument. It was tantalizing. Stretch every fiber of my being as I would, I could not quite make it. At last I turned about and extended one foot toward the object. My heart came to my throat. I could just touch the thing. But suppose that in my effort to drag it toward me I should accidentally shove it still farther away and thus entirely out of reach. Cold sweat broke out upon me from every pore. Slowly and cautiously I made the effort. My toes dropped upon the cold metal. Gradually I worked it toward me, until I felt that it was within reach of my hand, and a moment later I had turned about, and the precious thing was within my grasp. Assiduously I fell to work upon the Mayhar lock that held my chain. It was pitifully simple. A child might have picked it, and a moment later I was free. The Mayhars were now evidently completing their work at the table. One already turned away and was examining other victims, evidently with the intention of selecting the next subject. Those at the table had their backs toward me, but for the creature walking toward us I might have escaped that moment. Slowly the thing approached me when its attention was attracted by a huge slave chained a few yards to my right. Here the reptile stopped and commenced to go over the poor devil carefully, and as it did so its back turned toward me for an instant and in that instant I gave two mighty leaps that carried me out of the chamber into the corridor beyond, down which I raced with all the speed I could command. Where I was, or whither I was going, I knew not. My only thought was to place as much distance as possible between me and that frightful chamber of torture. Presently I reduced my speed to a brisk walk, and later realizing the danger of running into some new predicament, were I not careful, I moved still more slowly and cautiously. After a time I came to a passage that seemed in some mysterious way familiar to me, and presently, chancing to glance within a chamber which led from the corridor, I saw three Mayhars curled up in slumber upon a bed of skins. 
I could have shouted aloud in joy and relief. It was the same corridor and the same Mayhars that I had intended to have lead so important a role in our escape from Futra. Providence had indeed been kind to me, for the reptiles still slept. My one great danger now lay in returning to the upper levels in search of Perry and Gak. But there was nothing else to be done, and so I hastened upward. When I came to the frequented portions of the building, I found a large burden of skins in a corner, and these I lifted to my head, carrying them in such a way that ends and corners fell down about my shoulders, completely hiding my face. Thus disguised, I found Perry and Gak together in the chamber where we had been wont to eat and sleep. Both were glad to see me, it was needless to say, though of course they had known nothing of the fate that had been meted out to me by my judges. It was decided that no time should now be lost before attempting to put our plan of escape to the test, as I could not hope to remain hidden from the Sagoths long, nor could I forever carry that bale of skins about upon my head without arousing suspicion. However, it seemed likely that it would carry me once more safely through the crowded passages and chambers of the upper levels, and so I set out with Perry and Gak, the stench of the illy cured pelts fairly choking me. Together we repaired to the first tier of corridors beneath the main floor of the buildings, and here Perry and Gak halted to await me. The buildings are cut out of the solid limestone formation. There is nothing at all remarkable about their architecture. The rooms are sometimes rectangular, sometimes circular, and again oval in shape. The corridors which connect them are narrow and not always straight. The chambers are lighted by diffused sunlight reflected through tubes similar to those by which the avenues are lighted. The lower the tiers of chambers, the darker. Most of the corridors are entirely unlighted. The Mayhars can see quite well in semi-darkness. Down to the main floor we encountered many Mayhars, Sagoths, and slaves, but no attention was paid to us as we had become a part of the domestic life of the building. There was but a single entrance leading from the place into the avenue, and this was well guarded by Sagoths. This doorway alone were we forbidden to pass. It is true that we were not supposed to enter the deeper corridors and apartments except on special occasions when we were instructed to do so, but as we were considered a lower order without intelligence, there was little reason to fear that we could accomplish any harm by so doing, and so we were not hindered as we entered the corridor which led below. Wrapped in a skin, I carried three swords, and the two bows, and the arrows which Perry and I had fashioned. As many slaves bore skin-wrapped burdens to and fro, my load attracted no comment. Where I left Gak and Perry, there were no other creatures in sight, and so I withdrew one sword from the package, and leaving the balance of the weapons with Perry, started on alone toward the lower levels. Having come to the apartment in which the three Mayhars slept, I entered silently on tiptoe, forgetting that the creatures were without the sense of hearing. With a quick thrust through the heart I disposed of the first, but my second thrust was not so fortunate, so that before I could kill the next of my victims, it had hurled itself against the third who sprang quickly up, facing me with wide distended jaws. But fighting is not the occupation which the race of Mayhars loves, and when the thing saw that I had already dispatched two of its companions, and that my sword was red with their blood, it made a dash to escape me. But I was too quick for it, and so, half hopping, half flying, it scurried down another corridor, with me close upon its heels. Its escape meant the utter ruin of our plan, and in all probability my instant death. This thought lent wings to my feet, but even at my best I could do no more than hold my own with the leaping thing before me. Of a sudden it turned into an apartment on the right of the corridor, and an instant later, as I rushed in, I found myself facing two of the Mayhars. The one who had been there when we entered had been occupied with a number of metal vessels, into which had been put powders and liquids, as I judged from the array of flasks standing about upon the bench where it had been working. In an instant I realized what I had stumbled upon. It was the very room for the finding of which Perry had given me minute directions. It was the buried chamber in which was hidden the great secret of the race of Mayhars, and on the bench beside the flasks lay the skin-bound book which held the only copy of the thing I was to have sought after dispatching the three Mayhars in their sleep. There was no exit from the room other than the doorway in which I now stood facing the two frightful reptiles. Cornered, I knew that they would fight like demons, and that they were well equipped to fight if they must. Together they launched themselves upon me, and though I ran one of them through the heart on the instant, the other fastened its gleaming fangs about my sword-arm above the elbow, and then with her sharp talons commenced to rake me about the body, evidently intent upon disemboweling me. I saw that it was useless to hope that I might release my arm from that powerful vice-like grip which seemed to be severing my arm from my body. The pain I suffered was intense, but it only served to spur me to greater efforts to overcome my antagonist. 
Back and forth across the floor we struggled, the Mayhard dealing me terrific cutting blows with her forefeet while I attempted to protect my body with my left hand, at the same time watching for an opportunity to transfer my blade from my now useless sword hand to its rapidly weakening mate. At last I was successful, and with what seemed to be my last ounce of strength I ran the blade through the ugly body of my foe. Soundless as it had fought, it died, and though weak from pain and loss of blood, it was with an emotion of triumphant pride that I stepped across its convulsively stiffening corpse to snatch up the most potent secret of a world. A single glance assured me that it was the very thing that Perry had described to me, and as I grasped it, did I think of what it meant to the human race of Pellucidar? Did there flash through my mind the thought that countless generations of my own kind, yet unborn, would have reason to worship me for the thing that I had accomplished for them? I did not. I thought of a beautiful oval face gazing out of limpid eyes through a waving mass of jet-black hair. I thought of red-red lips, God made for kissing, and of a sudden apropos of nothing standing there alone in the secret chamber of the Mayhars of Lucidar. I realized that I loved Diane the Beautiful. End of chapter 11